Jeremy Tate, welcome to my show. We're going to talk about education. I got to ask you, first of all, when I look around me here in the great United States of America, although maybe it's not so great what I'm going to say next, um, <laughs> yeah. the education system, the public education system seems to be in free fall. Now, there's lots of exceptions. Mm. You know, there's lots of communities have great public school systems, but in general, all we read about and hear about is a collapsing public education system. I mean, you look at New York yeah. City, they, they spend more per capita than m many other parts of America, maybe the highest in America. And the results are deplorable, except for, you know, some mm. of the charter schools, uh, which we can talk about on private education. And by the way, it's not a knock on yeah. public education education there is a, a you know a place for that but the way it's constructed in america according to analysts and the critics uh, is you know it, it's just a total recipe for disaster what's your thoughts you know jada we we've we've gone uh we've embraced uh if you're a c.s lewis fan uh we have embraced in america uh what he describes uh as, as the green book and the abolition of man a uh, kind of education that is divorced from human formation uh, that is divorced from natural law, that is divorced from tradition. Uh, and instead, we've embraced one that's very much utilitarian focused. The whole point uh, of education in the U.S. right now, ma mainstream K-12, is college and career readiness. And it might not sound like there's anything wrong with that, but college and career readiness as the goal of education is different than the goal of education for almost every other generation. Historically, the goal of education was human formation. The goal of education was the cultivation of virtue. Uh, and, and the irony is that when college and career readiness becomes the goal, you end up with people that are not at all college and career ready. Uh, they're, not, they're not adults, they're not mature, they're not self-disciplined, uh, they don't have a good work ethic. Uh, so we're seeing a massive, massive uh, exodus right now uh, from the public school system. Homeschool, explosive growth in homeschooling, classical charters, every classical charter I know of has a, a massive wait list. Uh, classical Christian schools opening up left and right, a revival in Catholic school education as well. So it, it's exciting time. I, I'm optimistic actually getting that we, we perhaps hit rock bottom in American education. Any numbers on those um, charter schools and the, you know, the revival, it sounds like in Catholic education? Yeah, you know, it, it, we'll start maybe with the homeschool side. The homeschool side, we've gone from 13,000, the first time that we have good U.S. Census data on homeschooling in America, 13,000 in 1973, all the way to well over 5 million today. The homeschool, it, it's explosive. The charter school movement, especially in places like Texas, Arizona, more and more Louisiana, Colorado, even California, I, I cannot find, I mean, you can't find it, uh, one of these classical charter schools that does not have a wait list, often as big as the entire school. Uh, there's hundreds now of these classical charters. Uh, there is over 500 schools now in the country that are described as classical Christian schools. Uh, and so these schools are looking back to the past, not to try to take us back to the 1800s or something, but to say, you know what, we, we have forgotten we threw the baby out the bathwater we have forgotten uh so much of what the old world had right now they didn't have everything right uh but we need to bring the very best of the old world uh into the new world and that that's what clt wants to be doing as well yeah and so we get to what you're doing and you're offering the education system in a moment but um, in new york city uh new york state um, more specifically, they're spending something in the region of $28,000 per student uh, yeah. in the most recent budget numbers. Um, and the results are not, um, they're mediocre at best. Um, yeah. But, you know, the other the other issue that constantly comes up, at least in, in recent times, is the uh, curricula and the whole, um, let's call it the ideology that's increasingly running through the public um, education system and a kind sure. of, you know, disabuse me if I'm wrong, a kind of neo-Marxism, um, you know, in, 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 in the way things are set up. You know, I, I think what we're talking about here is, is a way uh, to, to view the world, right? It's impossible to not impart a worldview to students 
uh, when you're teaching. Any kind of education will do this. It has to by default. And so when we're talking about neo-Marxism, essentially what we're really talking about is imparting a worldview that primarily views the world through a lens of oppressed and oppressor, right? And I don't even think we have to say that there's that's it, it's wrong to take a look at the world through that that view, right? It's one of many different ways we could view the world through. But when the primary way to interpret everything is oppressed versus oppressor, it ends up getting a very warped view. Uh, and, and what it can ultimately do, which is so damaging, is that it can strip young people of agency. Uh, you know, this idea, I remember I taught my first three years, Jaden, in, in inner city New York. And it was not, uh, and this is a school, 100% minority population. It was not uh, the black teachers who grew up in New York who were teaching these ideas. It was the young, highly progressive white students, white teachers who grew up in affluent communities, who went to a college and got these ideas in their head. And they would come back and they would tell these students, you know, the system is, is stacked against you. I remember very well, uh, his name was Mr. Wilkinson. He grew up in Brooklyn, New York one of the best teachers in the building, 6'2 or 6'3. Uh, and he he got onto one of the new new teachers and he was saying, you're, you're teaching these students uh, that, that everything's stacked against them, that they cannot be masters of their own fate. You're taking agency away from them. That's what's so toxic about this, this Marxist ideology. Yeah, yeah, it, it's just running rapidly. So it, it, it's just going down just this awful, dangerous path. And there are reformers out there. There are critics and parents are trying to take back control in some school districts. But my gosh, it's a, an uphill battle. It is. You know, we've had 100 years of this. I mean, essentially, education really did not change fundamentally for 2000 years. Uh, the kind of education going back to St. Augustine, going back to Plato's Republic. Uh, it was an education that was rooted in the goal of it. Again, the goal of the education was to create, to cultivate virtue. Uh, it was the reason we started teaching history historically. The point of teaching history was to inspire heroic virtue in young people, right? To inspire a love of country. Uh, that is not what's happening in most most history classes uh, today at all. If anything, it's it's the exact opposite. So we have gone from 2000 years of classical education to now uh, a, a new, I think the best word for it is kind of secular progressive education that instead of building and drawing people into uh, the great traditions and history of the West, uh, it's really uh, undermining that tradition and making people kind of hate it, I think. Classic learning that you're referring to there um, is very popular now in the charter school system and homeschool system. Give us an overview of what it is for those who may not be all that familiar. Uh, I mean, if they're going through the public school system, a lot of parents will not be familiar with this and um, you may be doing them a great favor here. Yeah, I appreciate that, John. So for, for, for years, it wasn't called classical education. We didn't start calling it classical education until the 1980s or the 1990s, right? And the reason for that is that it was formerly just called education. That's all there was uh, until the beginning. I mean, think about an analogy here with something like milk, right? Now you go to the store and you see organic milk. Well, guess what? 200 years ago, 150 years ago, all milk was organic milk. And now we have to do, we have to add in this modifier uh, to say this milk is organic, right? Yeah. We're doing the same thing when we say classical education saying this is genuine education. This is a genuine article, right? This is education free from all the junk that has been put in, as in the case with, you know, we, again, we could continue down the road with the, the food analogy if we wanted to. But th this is education. What, so what is classical education? In some ways, it's impossible to define it because it is so big. But first and foremost, it is education where the goal is human formation and the cultivation of virtue. And by virtue, we mean at least the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and love, the four cardinal virtues of prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude. These are virtues that, that Western societies agreed on for thousands of years, uh, that these were uh, indisputable. We, we wanted each generation to come to exhibit eloquence and kindness and generosity. Uh, these are the seven lively virtues now as well. So character education, virtue education, 
this was the point. It's interesting to me, John, that for a long time, education was off, often just called formation. You know, they would say he's being sent off to formation or she's being sent off to formation because they were forming the habits, the disciplines, even the likes and the dislike, the taste, right? Giving young people, cultivating an elevated taste for higher things rather than lower things. Education is also the passing on of tradition. Uh, I love the way G.K. Chesterton defines education. He says it's simply the soul of a society as it passes from one generation to the next, right? And so we are handing down. I, I, I'd love to share with you, if I could, just yeah. a great image of what this looks like. I was at a bar ba mitzvah a number of years ago, and my daughter's friend was a very, very tiny girl, and uh, she, her parents physically handed her uh, the Torah, right? And it was massive. The Torah was massive. And you could hardly see the little girl's face when she was holding it, but it was part of the ceremony where the parents were physically passing down this great, rich intellectual inheritance to the next generation. That is what education is. It is passing down. And so we, we call this a great books education, right? Uh, an education that it is rooted in exploring, as Matthew Arnold said, the very best of what has been thought and said. The fact now that young people can go from pre-K to a PhD without reading a word of Shakespeare, a word of Dante, a word of Thomas Aquinas, a word of St. Augustine is, is really wild, but that's where we're at. Yeah. And so, as you said, then it's rooted in tradition and in Latin is probably on the curricula too, in many of these um, classic oriented Absolutely. schools. So if it works so well and is so brilliant as it is, you, you've convinced me and I've I always thought it was anyway, from what I knew of it. Why did we why did drift away from that? Why did, why did it sort of dissolve, at least in America? Yeah, it's, it's a great, great question. So how, how did we, if we had this great legacy of 2000 years of classical education, how did we get away from it? And it's a really interesting story. And I think it starts actually with compulsory education, right? In, in New England, in the, in the time period, right after the American Civil War. So what you have with that is not just uh, compulsory education laws, but you also have uh, industrialization going on, the factorizationing of every aspect of American life, right? Kind of the end of craftsmanship. Teaching is an art. Teaching is craftsmanship, right? And what we did is we tried to put education on a factory industrial kind of model instead. Schools very much came to resemble a factory in many ways in terms of uh, the building itself, uh, the regimented ways that the, the, the bells ring and whatnot. It's factory style education. And with that, as is the case in a factory, you don't teach things that are not useful. You don't do things in a factory that are not useful. So let's kind of explore this for a minute, right? Utilitarian education, pragmatic education, there's no value for philosophy. There's no value for art. There's no value for classical literature. There's no value for classical languages. Why? Because you don't use those things, right? And in one sense, sure, that's true. You're probably not going to use classical languages. You're probably not going to use, use classical literature, right? But these are the things that create the heart and soul of culture itself, right? Uh, what, what is culture apart from stories, apart from drama, apart from theater, movies, plays, right? These are the things that give substance and taste and flavor. We're talking about the traditional liberal, liberal arts. We're talking about the humanities here. And, um, and that was not in an education system that became highly focused on simply what will people use? And let's only talk about what people will use. You end up killing uh, any kind of vision itself. Again, students now can graduate high school and they've never even heard the word philosophy. All right. They've never heard the word theology. They never heard the word ethics before. Uh, and this is this would be really, really wild to any other generation. And, and look, even people on the political right, and I'm a conservative, actually, but people even on the political right question why we should study philosophy. Well, America literally is simply taking the very best of enlightenment philosophy and making a country with it. Right. I mean, they, they gathered the ideas of John Locke, and other Enlightenment philosophers about what would be the ideal country in terms of uh, checks and balances. 
and the authority the people would have over the state itself. Uh, we took those philosophical ideas and we made America with it. There's tremendous value to studying philosophy, to studying the history of ideas. And uh, we, we need to get back to this kind of education, John. Yeah. Uh, so th interesting the way you put it there. So why are more parents and students then rediscovering it now? And, um, you know, if it's the industrial society, you know, um, accelerated the push to this cookie cutter type of education we have in the public square, um, you know, what value do they see in going back to tradition? How will they will it serve them in the modern world? Yeah, and, and, and so, so well. I mean, let's talk about some of these colleges, you know, a school like Hillsdale, Thomas Aquinas College in California, Grove City, uh, St. John's in Annapolis. A school like St. John's in Annapolis, there's no majors. It's just a great books education. You read the best of what has been thought and said, and you do it for four years, right? And so you would say, well, then how does that make a good employee? Why would any parent want that? Well, what happens is they, they cultivate a tremendous amount of empathy. They cultivate a tremendous amount of the ability to listen well, to read well, to think well, to speak speak clearly, to articulate themselves clearly. Any employee wants those kinds of people right now. And in many ways, I think that's been the secret sauce of CLT's success. We hire heavily from Hillsdale College. We hire heavily from Patrick Henry. Uh, it's students that have had an education. And, you know, Mark Cuban, the, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks, yeah. He said this in an interview a few years ago. He said, look, in 10 years, there's going to be far more value to somebody with a serious liberal arts education than somebody with an engineering degree, right? Wow. Because, because what can you not automate? You can't automate being fully human, right? You can't automate anticipating where the, how the markets are going to evolve ahead of time and offering the perfect solutions, the perfect products and services at just the right time. There is no young person who has a, a better aptitude for navigating a, a, a rapidly changing job market than somebody with a classical education, right? Uh, they've learned how to think well, how to think clearly. So there's a pragmatic aspect of it that these students are going to be running the world in a couple decades. I mean, these are the best of the best are coming out of these homeschool and these classical charters. The other is that they're, they're also fleeing from the ideology that's being pushed in K-12, right? Mm -hmm. um, it is a lot of parents, you know, we can debate this or not. A lot of parents, they don't agree uh, that gender is fluid, right? Uh, they don't agree uh, with uh, some of these things that are now being taught under the banner of tolerance and acceptance. Mm -hmm. It has reached a point where parents are saying no, you know, and not, not even, you know, just religious parents. I think just normal Americans say, yeah. you know what? I don't want my boy coming home saying that he can become a girl if he wants to. Yeah. Uh, that is all very new and, and very, very ideological. Yeah. Um, what you say there, um, um, you know, about um, industrialization and the future of the workplace, um, we're looking at, you know, a lot more robotics technology. And on a mm. separate podcast that I am, I'm on every week, Odeon Capital Conversations, we've been talking about this, the mass introduction of robotics and the changing demographics um, of our workforce. And so you make a great point, you know, the liberal arts and a classic education will have a more important role going forward. My question, though, is can these um, influences that you pointed out there in the public education system, the ideologies, the, the gender um, curricula and um, the equity discussions, um, could they creep into classic education or, would they, you know, they're incompatible? A great question. Well, you know, in a classical school, students are often they're, they're sitting in a circle. Uh, they might be reading out loud uh, Plato's dialogues uh, and discussing as they go through it. Right. That's different than what is happening where they're often reading and discussing uh, some of the hot button contemporary issues in a mainstream public school without actually first doing um, part of what education ought to do is remove us from our own historical context, right? 
uh, that it is. And this is a unique gift of classical education that in many ways you're, you're free uh, from being in a classroom where uh, everybody already has their opinions about the current hot button issues of the day. And you can come to an older text. Maybe it's democracy in America. Maybe it's, maybe it's uh, D Dante's Inferno, whatever it may be. Maybe it's Augustine's Confessions and talk through it uh, with people who may have different political beliefs than you, uh, but you're still going to learn so much from that text and, and exploring the questions that are truly timeless. Mm. Uh, I think if, if, if classical education is going to become more uh, ideological in terms of pushing new ideology, I think it would cease to be classical education in, in any serious way. <laughs> Tell us about your classic uh, learning test and your program, because you're the CEO and co-founder of your own company, and it's had growing success, and it offers an alternative to the SATs yes. and the other testing um, systems that have been around for ages. Yeah, John, I appreciate uh, the question. And, uh, you know, we often think of standardized tests as first painfully boring, like who cares? Who wants to talk about standardized testing, right? So it seems very boring to a lot of people. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we often think of especially the SAT and ACT test as like, oh yeah, that's a college entrance exam that you go and take once or twice. The SAT and ACT, yes, you do take them for scholarships and for college admissions, but they play a much more powerful role in actually driving curriculum, right? The test, whatever gets tested ends up getting taught. And so if the main test that students are taking, if it requires them to read Chesterton or C.S. Lewis or St. Augustine, then that's going to change what they're reading in the classroom as well. And that was why we launched CLT. We thought, you know what, if we're going to have standardized tests and if these tests are going to be powerful in driving curriculum, then the test ought to put young people in front of the very best of what has been thought and said. Uh, and so that's what students encounter when they take the CLT. They may be reading Darwin, they may be reading Dante, they may be reading Shakespeare or Flannery O'Connor or Catherine of Siena, uh, but the, what they're not gonna be reading is what the SAT is doing. Two years ago, hundreds of thousands of students took the SAT and guess what they are reading? Bernie Sanders on the SAT, right? Wow. I, you can't make this up, you can't make this up. That is incredible, extraordinary really. And so, is your test and your program accepted by a lot of colleges or, you know, how, how does that work? Yeah, it's been accepted by over 200 colleges now. And, uh, and a lot of the colleges have actually gone test optional, uh, but a number are going back to requiring a test, especially for homeschool students. And so just recently, Purdue, uh, MIT, they went back to requiring a test. That's likely to continue to happen uh, in the future as a lot of colleges are seeing the downside of not having a test score. Uh, and kind of flying blind and often admitting the wrong students because they don't have a test score. Uh, so yeah, 200 colleges already accept the CLT and we anticipate full uh, adoption within the next five to 10 years. Okay, well, that's, that's, that's some serious growth and momentum um, if you hit that target. Um, so, but then I guess, doesn't that limit um, the number of colleges you know students would can get into or you know will they do yours alongside the SAT if they trying to keep all their options open yeah we, what we wanted to do is also just create a way better experience so I don't know if you're a Chick-fil-a fan John or not but I'm a big Chick-fil-a fan and uh, we uh, we say here we want to be the Chick-fil-a of standardized testing uh, and so you know you go to Chick-fil-a you may pull up and you're like holy smokes this line's going to take an hour Mm. And then in three in three minutes, you've got your nugget, you got your fries, you've got all the right sauces. They're very good at customer service. They're very good at giving a good experience to people. That's what we want to do at CLT. Students take the test from their house. They take it online through remote proctoring. It's two hours instead of four and a half hours. They submit the results and they get the results back in a few days versus a month or so for the SAT and ACT. Very good. And um, what? just give us some of the colleges that now accept it any names that we would yeah so some of the colleges that we just love that accept the clt that we we work with very closely uh hillsdale college calvin university grove city college uh, messiah st john's ave maria belmont abbey benedictine is a great college in kansas 
St. Thomas, Franciscan, uh, Thomas Aquinas, University of Dallas, Dallas Baptist, Baylor. Baylor is a great institution. Uh, so we, we've got about 200 partner colleges right now. And again, we, we do expect full adoption in the next five to 10 years. Because at, at this point, when colleges don't accept the CLT, they're missing out on some great, great students. Yeah. Um, just give us, how can people reach you, your website, contact information? Yeah, I appreciate that. The website is cltexam.com. Again, cltexam.com. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Jeremy Tate 41. Jeremy, this has been a most informative, educational and fascinating interview. Uh, good luck with all you're doing. And I hope you'll come back soon to, you know, keep us up to date on progress. And in the meantime, I'm going to check out, uh, what did you call it? Chick, Chick-fil-A, I guess it is. Chick-fil-A, Chick-fil-A. You got to yeah, have one. We have one in here in, in close to us <laughs> in the New Jersey area. And I do notice the lines, by the way. And so they must be doing something right. So yeah, if you're going <laughs> to emulate great. that kind of business model, you're on the road to stardom and success. <laughs> John, uh, thank you so much for the invite. Uh, it's great to connect. It's great to be on the show. Thank you.